Tonight, if you have your Bibles, please open to Psalm chapter 16. Psalm 16. A psalm that has some familiar verses in it. A psalm that I pray and hope will encourage your heart tonight. I've entitled this message, Three Thoughts About God. Sometimes in the psalm we'll have a question that's being answered. We'll have a plea from, from the writer. And perhaps he is discouraged. Perhaps he is overwhelmed. We've seen that. Sometimes he's just questioning, Lord, why does this happen this way? You know, why, why is it, the last question, why is it sometimes that it appears that the heathen, the unsaved, they prosper and the godly don't? But tonight, this psalm is one that just points our attention and our focus back on the Lord. I don't believe in this psalm as we read through it that you'll find anything that'll be like, boy, it'll hit you over the head. But I tell you what, any time that you walk away from the Bible and you're encouraged in the Lord, it's a good time. Because we are encouraged sometimes by our friends, and that's not bad. Sometimes we're encouraged by circumstances, and that's also not always a problem. But when we're encouraged by God himself, the character of God, the nature of God, the actions of God, this is a powerful experience. So if you would please, Psalm chapter 16, to read the Psalm of David. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. But to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight, their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my heart and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand There are pleasures forevermore. Lord, as we look at this psalm tonight, look at your truth. I'd ask that you would encourage our hearts tonight. Lord, may our thoughts be centered upon you. May we meet with you and you with us tonight. Lord, for a few moments, would you quiet our minds from all the distractions that can so quickly and easily distract us from your truth and your presence. Lord, I pray that your spirit would have liberty in this room and nothing would hinder him. Lord, we love you. We praise your name. We ask your help tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask. Amen. I wrote down some thoughts about this psalm as I read through it earlier this week and began to prepare for this message. I believe it's a psalm of deep comfort. My friends, there are times that you and I need deep comfort from the Lord. We're looking and we're saying, I need a shot in the arm. It's a a psalm of joy, protection, and salvation. A psalm where you enter maybe with your heart discouraged, but exit with your heart encouraged. You enter with your mind in defeat, but end with your mind in a place of victory. You enter where a spirit may be tormented, but you leave in freedom and comfort. Or in essence, How you walk into this psalm is not how you're able to walk out of this psalm. And I love how the Bible does that for us. How we approach the scripture and there are times we approach the scripture and we're not always in the right frame of mind or reference in life. Anybody with me yet? You walk into scripture because you know that's where you're supposed to be, but it's not where you necessarily desire at that moment to be. It's where you know where your spirit wants to be, but your flesh is fighting and swinging. And in a psalm like Psalm number 16, you walk into it, and maybe your spirit's not quite in the right place. Maybe your mind's not quite in the place that it should be. 
And maybe there's struggles there that you're battling back and forth. It could be a sin issue. It could be a discouraging issue. It could be uh, thoughts of doubt. And you enter with a spirit that's tormented or struggling in a mind or a heart that's discouraged. But my friends, as I read Psalm 16, I finish this psalm with this thought. My goodness, God sure is good. If you don't get anything else tonight, please remember this. God sure is good. From cover to cover, God is good. And he's not just a little bit good, he's a whole lot good. When life is good, God is still good. When life stinks, God is surely good. The three thoughts about God in this psalm I'd like to look at tonight and point our attention to. The first one we will find in these first four verses. And it's a thought about prayer. A thought about prayer. In case you're wondering, there are three P's tonight. I don't always alliterate, but tonight it, it turned out that way. Don't hate me. It is what it is. Look in verse number one. We see a simple prayer. You know what I love about the Bible when you read these simple prayers? To know that our prayers don't have to be fancy. You ever prayed with someone who's trying to make a fancy prayer? And they are just weaving all the V's and thou's into it, and they're quoting scripture back and forth. And you're like, well, that's a really fancy prayer. I wonder if God heard that. And I read my Bible, and I find simple prayers. I find simple prayers throughout the Bible. I find simple prayers from Jesus Christ toward the Heavenly Father. I find, and this is good because I'm a simple person. We don't have to be all fancy with our prayers. And look here in Psalm 16, the simple prayer. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Simple prayer, Lord, preserve me. It's a prayer, it's a prayer for guarding. Simple yet pro profound. He goes on the next few verses to talk about there are some, and, he, and the word there you find in Scripture, verse number three, is but to the saints. And you find as you read in the first four verses that he is saying, listen, Lord, guard me. There are some who have tasted of your goodness, some who are saints, some who have been touched by your handiwork, who know better, who don't look for your protection. In fact, they don't name your name as God even though they have claimed that. In fact, they are hastening after other gods. They've exalted something else in your life. And the writer here, David here says, Lord, I'm asking for a simple request. Lord, would you just preserve me? And this idea of preservation is one that God would put a hedge around me, a wall of protection, guard me, keep me, observe my every move. When I go to work, Lord, please preserve me. When I drive home, Lord, preserve me. As I pay the bills, Lord, I need your preservation. Lord, as I make decisions, I need your help. Lord, I'm out, I'm out shopping, I need your help. I'm at church, Lord, I need you to preserve me, preserve my family. It's a simple prayer, but a powerful prayer. We pray for the preservation and preserving of God with his power in our cars, at our work, at home, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, all the time. We need God to have our bases covered. We need God to have our bases covered, to thwart every possible weapon that could be formed against his children. God, you stop them, you preserve me. You remember there's a real devil out there the Bible says he's a roaring lion, and his goal is to devour anyone he can. He doesn't care if you've been saved one second or one million seconds. He doesn't care if you're male or female. There's only two. He doesn't care if you're old or young. There's only two. <laughs> he doesn't care. He's out, he's out to beat you up. The devil is. And here, a simple prayer. Lord, preserve me. Lord, there are some who, who know you and, and know of you and they've experienced you, but they hasten, they, they, they quickly follow other things, other gods, other idols that they've worshipped. And Lord, I need your help. I need your protection. I read about a commercial. Now, in our house, we typically don't watch commercials. We typically mute commercials. But I read about an illustration about a commercial from 1990. It was, a, it was a commercial between a Subaru and a Volvo. So you already know it's not going to be a good commercial right now. Apparently, as the commercial went, it shows a Volvo in this commercial heading toward 
a crash toward a wall in slow motion. Now, Volvos are notoriously safe cars, proven to be very safe in crashes. And in this commercial, it shows that the car hits the wall, smashes the front of the wall, and it is a complete wreck, but the passengers are completely fine. Shows the protection and the preservation that this Volvo offered them. And then it showed a Subaru in slow motion heading toward the same wall. And in the commercial, apparently with a screeching of brakes, the Subaru stopped inches from the wall. The commercial had this line, what would you prefer, to live through wrecks or not get them in, the, get, get in, them in the first place? I don't know about you, but I'd rather not get them in the first place. I'd rather know that my car would stop first, that it would protect me in a crash. My friends, I pray for the preservation of God for you, for your families. I'm not, not figuratively, like literally I pray for God's protection on your life. And in your families, in your home, at work. The devil wants to destroy this church. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy any goodness inside of you, any working of God in your life. The devil wants to destroy every bit of it. I mentioned this Wednesday, but I'm, I'm begging and asking that you pray that God would protect this, this church. Anytime you move forward, that paints a target on your back. You see, the devil's not worried if people are sitting idly by. My friends, when we move forward, when we ask for God's help, when we ask for God's harvest, his increase, that says, listen, it says, kick me. And my friends, the devil would gladly oblige. And but for the power of God, but for the preservation of God, he can succeed. Simple prayer to God. Lord, preserve me. Tonight, maybe you need to begin to pray, Lord, preserve me. Lord, guard me. Lord, I need your help. Lord, in my house, I need your help. Lord, in my thoughts, I need your help. Lord, in my words, I need your help. Guard me. Lord, in my finances, I need your help. Lord, my kids, we need your help. Lord, my wife, my husband, my future wife, my future husband. Lord, my future grandkids. Lord, my grandfather, my grandmother, my Sunday school teacher, the bus driver. You see, I find that the enemy doesn't care how he wins, just that he wins. If he can get, if he can get the bus driver to fall, he still marks it up as a win. Lord, preserve me. First thought about God is the thought about prayer. I'm so thankful that in this thought about God that he hears our prayers. In fact, he says this, I can boldly approach the throne of grace. When I pray, God, you preserve me, please, he hears me and he answers. But a second thought in this passage, I see a thought about praise. Look, beginning in verse number five tonight. Well, verse number three, we see a little bit. End of verse number three, in whom I, is all my delight. And then beginning in verse number five. The Lord is my portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in, in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I see a thought about praise in this psalm. I see, first of all, some comfort in praise. The Bible says, end of verse number three, in whom is all my delight. What brings you delight in life? Chocolate, that's it, chocolate. My team winning. There's my delight. Comfort in my finances. What brings you delight? The writer here says, my delight is in the Lord. It's like, honey, you do me a favor. Would you come up here? Oh, no, I'm going to pay for this. <laughs> what do they say? Go big or go home. I may need a home tonight. Stand right here, honey, if you don't mind. Just for a second. You don't do anything. 
I delight in my wife. I like to be with her. She likes to be with me, usually. <laughs> usually. She's like, will you hold hands with me? Of course, I'm good looking, that's why. <laughs> oh, thanks, honey, I love you too. But if we can, folks, how often do you delight in Jesus Christ? Sometimes we're like this. Oh, I like that person. I like Jesus. He's over there. Boy, he, he sure is pleasant to look at. I don't want to get too close to him. I don't need to get too close. As long as I talk about him, as long as I just tell people that I delight in him over there, it'll be okay. But how much praise is there when we get close? I delighted in him. She's really uncomfortable. You can sit down, honey. Thank you. Do I still get supper? No. <laughs> My friends, I think you know, and you can take the illustration, you can go to a good friend, you can go to a special someone in your life. But my friends, it's about delighting in Jesus Christ. A thought about praise. How close are you to Jesus? How close are you to the Lord? Do you smile when you hear from him? I tell you what, we sing these songs in church, and I can't help but smile, think about the Lord, and, and man, his goodness to us this morning. We sing the great song, Like a River Glorious. I mentioned that this morning, that phrase, stayed upon Jehovah. If he stayed upon God, I enjoy reading my Bible in the morning. Why? I learn about God. Sometimes I laugh when I read the Bible. Sometimes, often, my conscience is pricked when I read the Bible. My, good, my goodness, my friends, there's a comfort here. In whom is all my delight? But I see it's like the psalmist is kind of reminiscing, smiling about this praise. Look, please, in verse number 5. And look what he says. It's kind of like he's bragging a little bit here. As he's praising the Lord, the Lord is the portion of my inheritance. Now, if we double back and look earlier in the chapter, we see uh, in verse number three the word the saints, which are the saints. It could possibly be a reference to the, to the priests that would have been serving during this time. Now, the priests, many of them did err, or some did err from their way. But if you compare that to this verse here, the priests, they didn't get a portion of land. When all the land was divided up, their portion was not a section of land to enjoy. It was not a place with some hills and some ponds and, and some trees and some or or orchards or anything like that. Their portion was God. And some would look at that and say, wow, well, I'd rather have a five-acre field. But the writer here says, listen, you can have your lands, you can have your houses, you can have all those things you think are valuable, but I get Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Jesus is more than enough. He is more than abundant in joy. He is more than abundant in comfort. Jesus is the portion of my inheritance. You can have your fame, you can have your glory. You can have your fancy cars and fancy houses, have your big vacations, own your private jets and your private islands and your, and your huge yachts. But my friends, as Christians, our portion is Jesus himself. Join heirs with Jesus. It's like the writer says, listen, <laughs> you have all that, but I'm not worried, I have Jesus. I read a story about an ancient Persian he owned a very large farm and had orchards and grain fields and gardens. He was a wealthy, contented man until one day a man from the east came. And the man from the east spoke of this new thing, this new wealth found in diamonds. This Persian didn't have diamonds, had never heard of diamonds. But this man from the east spoke of how wealthy he would be if he had diamonds and if he owned a diamond mine. This Persian man went to bed that night a poor man. 
Not poor because his orchard stopped producing. Not poor because his grain fields were dried up and his gardens were dead. He was poor because in his spirit he became discontented. My friends, we are rich with Jesus Christ. We are rich. And if we feel poor, it is not because we are poor. It's because we're discontented. Take the world but give me Jesus. And then I see a celebration. I love this verse. Verse number six. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. You know what people say is important is not really important. Do you know this? A few questions to think about. Maybe if you could write down answers. I want you to name right now the five wealthiest people in the world. You may get one or two there. You probably wouldn't get all five. When you're done with that, name the last five Heisman Trophy winners. When you're done with that, I want you to name ten people, not the the most recent ten, but ten people at all, who have won the Nobel or the Pulitzer Prize. And then name the last ten World Series winners. Now the fact is we would get some of those answers. Some would get more than others. Maybe some here would get some Eisman Trophy winners and others would get the Nobel Peace or the Pulitzer Prize winners. Maybe some would even get four of the five wealthiest people in the world. But then in contrast, I want you to answer these four questions. List a few teachers who have aided you in your journey through school. Name three friends, three Christian friends who have helped assist you through a difficult time in life. Name five people who have taught you a spiritual lesson. Think of three people who you feel appreciate you for your work for the Lord. You see, what we say is important isn't really important. The world would say that a Heisman Trophy winner, a wealthy person, wealthiest in the world, boy, they ought to be, they ought to be lifted up. And they won the World Series. But my friends, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I want to point our attention to one other place tonight, the last few verses. It's a thought about our placement. Verse number eight. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We can blame a lot of things. We can put the blame on our circumstances. We can put the blame on our upbringing. We can put the blame on the people around us. If so-and-so was nicer, if they were kinder and said this, then, then I would be more in life. But at the end of the day, the issue that we have is either we are with God or we are not with God. I'll say it this way. A man told his doctor that he wasn't able to do all those things around the house that he used to be able to do. When the examination was complete, he said, Now, Doc, I'm a man. I can take it. Tell me in plain English what's wrong with me. The doctor said, Well, in plain English, you're lazy. The man said, Well, okay, well, then give me the medical term so I can tell my wife. And we can try to position it and pivot it any way that we want to. We can say it's because of this and because of this. But at the end of the day, there's a thought about protection. And, and the Bible says this. It says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. The reason that we can have strength and stability in life is because God's protection and his help and his strength can be upon us. I'll give you one final illustration that will be done tonight. I need James, if I can. All right, not Doreen, James. All right. Brenton, yeah, your shoulders out. I'll take you. Yeah, yeah, can you help me? Yeah, you help me, Brenton. Thanks, buddy. 
All right, Brent, you're going to be the devil. All right, so you stand right over there. <laughs> Doing a great job. Okay. Give me a good look. Okay, that's excellent. Yeah. All right, now James here is going to be a Christian tonight. All right, and the Bible says that he says, I've, I've put the Lord before me. He's at my right hand. Okay? So, James, where's your right hand? Good. Okay. Be on this side. So the idea, like from the beginning of the psalm, Lord, preserve me. Right? I want your help and protection. Lord, I delight in you. I, want to, I find my comfort and satisfaction in you. There's the idea in this, throughout this entire psalm that there is a close proximity. You with me so far? All right, so James, get real close to me. Right? And lock in. All right. Now, James has me. Right? But more importantly, I have James. Now, if James doesn't have me, Brenton can come in and have full party. Boy, you are devious. <laughs> but a thought about placement. If he's here, then who gets to fight the battle here? He can come in front. It's all right. Go ahead, man. You can come in front. I've got Brenton. I'll be okay, right? I'll be okay. You can keep on going, man. I don't, don't want to hurt you. All right? <laughs> I'm not worried. I'm not worried. You worried? A little bit? <laughs> My friends, this is true, right? We get worried. But if we're locked in here, thought about placement, what do we have to worry about? The Bible says, you're at my right hand, so I shall not be moved. It doesn't say that I just choose not to be moved. It says, because you're at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So the Lord's there, and he says, listen, take your best shot. It's not going to matter a lick. Thanks, boys. Thanks. Three thoughts about God tonight. Thought about prayer, thought about praise, thought about placement. And probably the most important thought is the placement part, where are you at? Because if you're close to God, you have his preservation, his protection. If you're close to God, you end up praising him because you see how good he is. You find your delight in him. You're like, my goodness, I just can't keep my mouth shut about how good he is. And when you're that close to the Lord... When you're close to him, he's at your right hand. You lock in. My friends, you have the strength of God himself. You may come tonight with your heart discouraged, but you can leave with your heart encouraged. You come in with your mind all over the place, you can leave with your mind centered on Jesus Christ. You can come in with your spirit in torment and trouble. You can leave with your spirit encouraged in victory. Because I don't have to be moved. I won't be moved. I shall not be moved. Because my God is at my right hand. And in his presence, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. That's what it looks like to be close to your God. Lord.